Hi, everyone. I'll introduce myself. My name is Lily Alice Walker Stiefel. I'm the founder here at the Mix Space. I go by she, her pronouns. I um, identify as Black and mixed. I'm a Leo. My people come from New Orleans, from Germany, from Ireland, and from the larger African diaspora. I'm currently in New York, um, which is uh, Lenape land. And we will be dropping our more formal land acknowledgement in the chat, but I do want to read just a chunk of it. It's really important to me, especially um, seeing as we're talking about food sovereignty and food justice here today. So um, this land acknowledgement is a critical step towards working with native communities to secure meaningful partnerships and inclusion in the stewardship and protection of their cultural resources and homelands. Um, and many of us are settlers, immigrants, descendants of those forcefully brought to this continent. Our institutions were founded upon exclusions and erasures of the indigenous peoples whose land we are located on. So we honor and we are grateful for the land that we occupy and we recognize the ongoing damage of settler colonialism. And this land acknowledgement demonstrates a commitment to beginning the process of working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of colonialism in the pursuit of truth. I um, also have a tradition that um, we follow here sometimes at the mixed space in which I follow my matriarchal line to honor the women in my heritage and other women um, that are currently alive and women who are my ancestral guides. Um, they are with me here and they are the reason that I show up to do this work. So I am Lily, the daughter of Linda, who is the daughter of Peg or Margaret, but I called her Nani, um, who is the daughter of Florence. And I want to honor Gail Cabral, Carol Walker, my Auntie Carla, and Kim, and Ebony, and Karen, and Carol. Those are the women that I'm feeling here with me today. Thank you so much for that, Lily. Um, I just want to take a quick moment to introduce myself. My name is Arielle. I go by she, her pronouns. I help out with PR and social media at the Mixed Space. I identify as mixed and Latina. My people are from Poland and Mexico. Um, just some land acknowledgements for me. I'm currently calling it from Chicago and Chicago is located on the traditional <laughs> lands of the Council of the Three Fires, the Ojibwa, Ottawa, and Potawatomi nations. However, other tribes such as the Miami, Ho-Chunk, Menominee, Sac, and Fox also called the Chicagoland area home. Um, yes, and um, that's a little bit about me. I'd like to take a moment right now to just have um, a moment of silence. We'd like to hold these moments of silence every month, every meetup for 30 seconds. And so I'd just like to take a moment now um, for the farm workers, laborers, indigenous peoples, the land, and for those who are on the ground working and making it possible for people to have food on their table. So I just want to take a 30 second moment of silence for them. And if you would like anyone to be recognized in this moment of silence, please share that in the chat with us. Hey. Hello. Thank you. Hi, Flo. So Quiet. Nice I'm to do myself. How are you doing? How are you doing? <laughs> well, I am Flordisha, Hi, Flo. daughter, the daughter of Betty. Bye. Who was the daughter of Florida, who was the daughter of Mary. So I just want to say I'm, I'm really appreciating this space right now. And uh, y'all keep it going. Keep it going. I'm feeling this energy. <laughs> Thank you. And through the virtual Zoom space. I love that. That means it's powerful. Um, okay. Our July meetup is all about food sovereignty. And to me, that means the power and the authority to govern ourselves in the way that we eat. Um, food that is nutritious and fresh is a human right. 
and the accessibility to such foods is necessary for survival. And yet not all communities have access to fresh foods or even grocery stores that provide nutritious food. So this is a huge topic and that's why we're here. That's the work that we're here for. Every month here at the Mixed Space, we choose a large subject and we explore it through different perspectives. And today we're looking through the lens of food justice, food apartheid, community building, development, and what it really means to grow our own food. At this point, I'd like to name Karen Washington, whose energy and leadership and wisdom has been a deeply impactful collaborator in the way that we're curating these conversations. So I just want to say thank you at this point. And now move on to introducing our July speaker. Today's speaker is a fierce crusader for justice who has been directly involved in activism for over 20 years. She's risked her life to protest for Black Lives Matter, also advocating for transgender women of color. And over the, light, over the years, her life as an activist, she's been part of the Black Panther Party. She's been part of the Poor People's Campaign. She's fought unjust court cases and has organized protests and continues to demonstrate her fearless leadership. Her fight for justice had led, has led her to working in the environmental justice and the climate change, urban heat, uh, food shaming, food apartheid, ultimately fighting in her community to build community gardens and to provide people with access to fresh produce. Um, she's won many awards and she's well known in her community for the hard work and the consistent effort that she puts in. Um, she's a mother and a grandmother and through getting to know her in preparation for this meetup, she feels like family to us. So we're proud and honored to introduce Miss Alinka Green. Hi, y'all. Hey, y'all. Um, I'm honored to be here. Thank y'all so much for this space. Um, I'm truly humbled to be here. So um, again, thank y'all for, um, for inviting me here at the party. So I'm thankful to be here. Malika, we are so grateful to have you. I'm so excited to hear what you're going to say. We have a very special interview lined up with Alinka right now, and um, that is going to start momentarily. I do just want to say that our team works very hard to create these meetups every month, so we really appreciate you taking the time to experience them with us. We believe in paying it forward and facilitating collaborations between organizations. So while our meetups are free, we do accept donations and give them to a different organization each month. This month, our speaker, Olenka, chose Daughters of the Diaspora to receive donations from this meetup. Daughters of the Diaspora is a nonprofit organization empowering Black women to be stakeholders throughout the world. We will double all donations received today, so please send your donations to the link in the chat that we just dropped. And check out Daughters of the Diaspora on Facebook, which we also will be linking in the chat. Um, as we are interviewing Olenka, as this interview happens, Feel free to write down any questions you have because we will have a Q&A session following the interview. Um, so just if you have any questions for Alinka along the way, you can put them in the chat and we will hold on to them and bring them back for our Q&A portion. You can also private message any of us that has TMS team or TMS in our bio um, on Zoom about anything you need or if you have any questions that you want us to ask on behalf of you during the Q&A portion. And now we will uh, go quickly into our community guidelines. So these are guidelines that we have that just sort of, we ask that um, we govern the space with as we have these conversations. The first one, um, I will read, but we're gonna do a fun little thing where we're gonna popcorn it. So we're gonna ask the community, if you feel comfortable to read um, one of these guidelines, we'll give you an example of how it goes. And um, then we will read all these together. So the first one I'll read, which is encourage, engagement is encouraged. So just please raise your hand to add a comment or question. Just, um, just be engaging with us. We know it's hard on Zoom, but just feel free to share with us. And I will popcorn it now to Wilminka. Say, ouch, if someone says something that hurts you, generally apologize mm -hmm. out as someone who knows 
that they take up a lot of space in the conversation to move in and move out. Do you want to popcorn it to someone else, Alinka? Yes, I would uh, popcorn it to uh, Flo. So we did number three, I'm Sexy, I'm Sassy. You read number four, so I'll take number five, which is identifiers. Name your identifiers and respect others' identifiers. That means their pronouns or their racial identifiers, anything like that. Um, I see you, Maureen. I'm going to popcorn to Maureen if you want to take yourself off mute and read community guideline number six. Okay, mean what you say. We can't control other members' responses, but we can make sure we're putting thought into our words and being held accountable if need be. Thank you. Popcorn it to someone else, whoever's name you see. Uh, Sorry, I'm not on that view. (laughs) Okay. Um, Popcorn it to Angela. Great. Thank you. Angela Brown. Ooh, we can't hear you. Oh, there you go. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Number seven, okay. Uh, confidentiality. Share your learning, not the other person's privacy. Ask permission from the person before sharing content outside of the group. Yes. Popcorn it to whoever you like. Okay, make it gallery. Hey, how do I get this off of here? Come on. Wish there's a live transcript, closed captioning. Okay, I will. Popcorn it to Brandon. Hi, okay. Disagree with the idea, not the person. This is a space for constructive dialogue. Avoid making personal attacks and focus on I statements. Um, And then the people that I see are Ashley Bowl. Number nine, moments of growth. TMS moderators see conflict as an opportunity for shared growth. We believe if the community guidelines are followed, this can be achieved. Awesome. And and let's see, I'm going to popcorn it to one second. Uh, I don't see two. I'll popcorn it to Victoria. Uh, If you like it, let us know. We encourage members to snap or wave when they hear something that resonates with them. Thank you. So everyone, if you agree to these guidelines, just hold up your thumb into the camera, show us that you heard us and that um, we're ready for the, for the conversation. Um, I'm just going to start us off again. Ariel said this already. Any questions that you have, pop them in the chat. Um, Also, share your socials in the chat. We definitely want to connect with you. People are popping in and out depending on their schedule. So it's just great to know that you're in a space with like-minded individuals who are doing work with you. Um, You're not alone. These are people whose social media feeds you probably want to be following because at least you won't be reading trash that hurts your feelings, hopefully. So um, Alinka, first question, how did you get involved in the food justice space? Okay, I'm good now. Okay, hi, can y'all guys hear me now? Okay, um, first of all, um, I got involved in the food justice space um, when I joined the new when I joined the New Black Panther Party back in 1991. Um, we started studying the the ten point platform, and we also started studying the the survival program that the Black Panther Party. Had, and one of those was doing the breakfast program and the free groceries program. So we used to go down to a housing development in Dallas, uh, Texas, called the Burst Street Projects on, um, during the summertime. And we would have 30 to 40 children that we would feed um, breakfast and lunch um, in a housing development. And what we would do is that we would go to local grocery stores and we would get eggs, we would get milk, um, we would get bacon. And sometimes if we couldn't get bacon, we would get deer meat and we would feed the children because we found out during the summertime, there was no federal lunch programs there. 
Uh, you know, nobody was coming in feeding the kids. And then, you know, if your mom is standing in the housing project, your food stamps is low. So those kids still needed to eat. And so um, we we put into practice, uh, we put into work with the Black Panther Party taught us about the breakfast program. Um, going down there, volunteering, doing the eggs, grits, bacon, biscuits, fruit, milk for the children. And not only that, but providing commodities to the mothers, um, you know, eggs, milk, grits, rice, cheese uh, to the family. So that is where uh, I got into uh, really the food, um, food justice movement of feeding 40 kids, you know, during the summertime. Uh, because um, the children, you know, the children will be waiting on us, you know, to come in and cook breakfast. And so the children, you know, a lot of them were malnourished. Um, and you can't really think and you can't really grow unless you have that type of uh, nutrient. So we made sure that they had a well-balanced breakfast and lunch during the summertime um, when, you know, when I was in the, in the Black Panther Party here in Dallas, Texas. So, again, it came from us knowing about the survival programs. And um, it's because of the Black Panther Party and the breakfast program that hot breakfast served in the schools because before that, the uh, children were not getting hot breakfast. And so uh, 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 they came, you know, came along, Bobby Seals and them came together and said, you know what, we need to feed these kids because if you feed the children, then you feed their minds. So that was one of the biggest uh, programs that they had. And J. Edgar Hoover was not so concerned about the guns. He was concerned about the feeding of children. And so what happened after the Panthers started doing it, the United States government picked it up. Um, you will see, you know, uh, you know, a head start picked it up. Um, so out of that survival program, uh, breakfast programs, lunch programs, and also mutual aid, because you and them used to give over a thousand groceries out to the community. So if you community, if you feed the community, you connect the community. So that's how I got into the food space um, uh, uh, movement. Thank you. So you've spoken a lot about the power that comes with feeding people. And that obviously is connected to where we get our food and who we get our food from determines how independent we are and how much power, I mean, we have over our lives, really. Can you right. expand on this? And yeah. Um, yeah. So basically, uh, and really, before we get started, I really want to talk about when we start talking about food sovereignty. There's a difference between food justice and food sovereignty. Food, food justice is just like, like we were talking about, you know, giving out the lunch and the breakfast to the children. Food sovereignty means that you outright own the land where the eggs and the chicken and the milk and the vegetables are grown. So, you know, that 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 movement came out um, through through a coalition of, of, of indigenous people coming together and saying that we're going to come up and we're going to come up with our own constitution of that, how we want to own our own land, food sovereignty. And so, uh, and uh, so I would have everybody to look up food sovereignty, what that means. And really the six pillars of it is to focus on food for the people, put the people first and, uh, for, you know, uh, focus on food for people, put people's need for food at the center um, build knowledge and skills on how to grow your own food, um, work with nature, value the food providers, uh, localize the food system, and have control uh, locally, because food is sacred. Now, when you ask me about where the food comes from, I went and did a little research here in Dallas. I went to four local grocery stores. I went to two in the 7521 uh, six area where I used to live at, and I won't name the stores, but they were they were African. They were set in African American communities. When I went into one of the stores, the vegetables looked so bad I walked out. When I talked to some of the people that work in the store, they told me that their milk and egg truck come only once a week. I asked them how far did their meat come from. They told me that the meat comes from. Uh, from Colorado and Mexico. 
It's not how, it's, there's no meat packing plants here. So that means that meat that comes into that grocery store has to come from, from, Cal, come from Colorado or Mexico. When I was looking at the fish, it comes from Vietnam, Thailand, uh, 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 Guatemala. So the food comes from many different areas. Comes from many different areas. There's nothing really locally produced here as far as going into those African American and brown stores that's in that community. Now, when I went to the other one in my area, which is a predominantly uh, upper class white community, I walked in and I talked to the guy at the meat market. He told me that their truck comes every day. The milk truck comes every day. The egg truck comes every day. Their food comes from as far as Canada. Uh, uh, it comes from all over. Canada, New Mexico, uh, California, and everything is implemented in. And plus, they work with local farmers here in Texas. But I only saw a couple of black farmers, and they were mentioned on an edible magazine that they have. So the majority of the food source that comes in from these stores that I talked about, they are outsourced. Now, the watermelons and tomatoes and things like that, they might come in. But the big products, that comes in from another place. And so then that goes back into empowerment. When we had the storm in February, when those trucks could not get through, you can hardly get catfish now because of the ice storm. When the ice storm, because it killed all the catfish. When the ice storm came, and this is dealing with transportation, when those trucks could not get through, the stores were bare. So that means due to transportation or uh, weather um, mm -hmm. or, or lack of gas, you may not get the food that you need. And so what happened in that case is that a lot of people in our community like Feed to People, Not My Sons, um, uh, Black Cross, uh, 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 Daughters of the Diaspora, uh, uh, Dallas Stop the Eviction, we did what was called a uh, uh, commissary is very necessary, did what was called mutual aid. We made sure that we got food to the people. Now, I had COVID during that, during that, during that ice storm, so I couldn't get out. Those groups that I spoke about, they brought groceries to us. So because we couldn't get to the grocery store, a lot of us had COVID. I would have been really, really messed up if it had not been for that. So we had to take control of those situations of feeding our people. So again, if the large organizations are not able to do it, we have to depend on mutual aid and community-based organizations to do it. So that is really taking the power back into our hands. And that's how I want to expand on that, because due to the ice storm, due to COVID, a lot of people, you know, a lot, a lot of people were hungry. A lot of people did not have power. A lot of people did not have lights. And so when I stayed in a hotel uh, uh, funded through Tremonica Brown, we had food every day. We had people in the community cooking hot food, uh, you, know, bur you know, bringing soup. We had restaurants. We had people you know, battling uh, the cold and the ice to make sure that we was housed. This was not done by the city of Dallas. This was solely done by the people. So that is what it is. The people have the power to do that. And so ever since January, February, that has been a continuum of food and mutual aid in this community, founded and uh, funded and found by the people. So I hope I answered your question. Yes. I'm just going to let that sink in for a second, too, and give everyone a chance to really process what you're saying. Also, because there is an amazing community happening here in the chat, as always, um, and folks sharing resources. So our meetups are always like a hodgepodge. It's like I've got Google open, looking up at the resources that people are sharing, listening to you. Like there's there's a lot going on. But um what I also wanted for you to talk about is 
community gardens. Like, cause what you're saying, it's, it's the people, it's the right. people that are coming together that are supporting each other, that are making sure that we're fed. And especially in, in these circumstances when we really can't rely on anybody else, right. um, this is also where the community garden work comes in and providing access to nutritional vitamin rich, fresh foods out the ground. Like, can you talk right. about that? Yes. Yes. And so, um, I want to shout out to uh, 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 Skip Chocolate Foundation. Also, commissary is very necessary. Um, uh, feed the people because ever since the February ice storm, we have had over 60 community gardens growing in the brown and black communities. And so that means uh, that we are now able to get fresh produce with the dirt on it. Uh, shout out to Pan African Connection, Sister Kwete Bandeli, who every Saturday, every Sunday, has over three hundred pound more, probably more than that, uh, pounds of uh, uh, boxes and boxes of fresh fruit, bananas, avocados, pineapples, uh, uh, Brussels sprouts, lettuce. You name it, we have it there because the community comes together and brings that fresh fruit food there. Also, we have what we call the community fridge. Uh, a lot of people have what they call the funky fridge movement. Is that where people set up refrigerators in the community and we put milk and eggs, uh, applesauce in there and people can come up who might be homeless. It might be a mother across the street who can't feed her kids, you know, with everything. You can go right over there to the community fridge and get it. But we have had an explosion. We have not had this many community gardens grown in our community since World War II. Where people were actually, you know, doing, you know, having to do the rations and, and grow for your food. We have had a, a, a an explosion of community gardens. Uh, big carrots. Matter of fact, I've got a, uh, I don't know if you can see it. Uh, Jen, can you hand me that, that squash? Just show you one of the uh, squashes that we got. It's up there on the cabinet. You see it? It's the big yellow squash up here. here right there. You see it? Not a big yellow squash. You see it? It looks like a big ball. It's got the fall on top of it. Yeah. Just want to show you some of the produce that we get. This is some of the produce that we get from the community gardens. Just things like this. This is what we get in a box from the community gardens. So, um, so you know, uh, fresh vegetables, getting the carrots, getting the lettuce, getting the tomatoes, getting the turnips with the dirt still on, you know. So we're very proud to be able to say that, you know, that, that, that our community is doing this. You know, they called it World War II gardens. We call it, you know, mutual aid and community gardens. And it gives empowerment back to the people uh, to see the children out there, you know, digging in the earth. Uh, you know, uh, you know, measuring what a community garden is going to grow, seeing the greens, seeing the watermelons come up, the cherry tomatoes. It, it's a beautiful thing to see that. And plus, we get our elders out there and it gives them something to do to put their hands back in the dirt. So we really have to engage our elders on the process because we have to understand that this country was built on the back of black people uh, uh, in farming. If you look at South Carolina from out of space or from a drone, you see how that whole landscape in South Carolina was changed so the, the Africans from uh, uh, the Igbos could grow rice. South Carolina has some of the best rice in the, in, in the United States, but it was built, uh, it, was, it was cultivated by black people's hands. Black dirt, black hands. So We've always been farmed. And we have to look at it that after construction during World War II and all of that, black farmers, there were more, there were a lot of black farmers in this country. But due to the United States government not giving those black farmers the aid that they needed to keep their farms, they lost their farms. And it went to it went to it went to uh, 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 white farms. And and I, and I don't want to get off the subject, but even when we're talking about soy. I learned the other day that there was a, a, a white gentleman who was a producer of soy. He named his soybeans or the strain of his soybeans after Confederate generals. 
So even in that, in the South, even with the soy plants, that was white supremacy in the soy. So we don't, you know, naming these beans, these strands, after these people that kept our people enslaved. So crops of tobacco and peas and California, I mean, uh, 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 South Carolina rice could be grown. So we have to understand that when we're talking about food sovereignty, and so when we look at how land has been taken from the indigenous people, when we even talk about, uh, uh, that's why I don't eat dole pineapple. Because we look at how the Dole Company came in and colonized Hawaii, dethroned their monarch, came up with a fake war, and dethroned them so the Dole uh, uh, pineapple people could come in. So we got to look at the names that's on this food. We got to look at the names of when we go into these products, when we buy these products. We got to see the names behind it. We got to understand the history. And I don't eat Dole pineapple because I know what it did to the sovereign people of Hawaii. So that's just for that when we're talking about a historical context about the power of food and the power of owning and, and having a narrative of what you grow. Woo. Speak it, speak it. Thank you. And thank you for all the amazing comments that are coming here in the chat too. Um, Trevor, I see your question. We're going to hold it for a little bit. We have a couple more to get through and then absolutely we'll make space for your question. Um, Alinka, I have one, one last question and, and then I'll hand it to Ariel. But um, you did talk about the Black Panther Party and how they laid the, ground, the, the groundwork for a lot of what you're doing and, and how communities are fed. And what I'm interested in is the residential segregation that you talked about earlier as well and how how big of a role that really plays, like where you live, the your um, your. Um, right, right, yeah. right. That, resi that residential segregation. Oh, boy, man, let me tell you something. Uh, whew, I, you know, I get chills when we talk about that residential segregation because uh, that leads into not only residential segregation, but when we're talking about food mirages, and we don't want to use the word food desert anymore because it's not a food desert. Um, it's a food, it's food apartheid. And that goes into when we're talking about the residential segregation, when they write, when they redline us into a certain area, uh, they redline us into a, a way of living that, 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 that permeates for generations. You know, uh, we have to look at it as far as when uh when 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 we when we're talking about that is that you you redline a whole community of people to a little strip of land we can even talk about palestine within that where the israeli government has destroyed all the olive trees the 98% of the water in the gaza strip is poisonous but yet you you put these people into a little bitty tiny area you kill their livestock. You destroy their houses. So when we're talking about residential segregation, we're talking about redlining you for years where you cannot get the best food. You cannot get the best schools. You get substandard housing. You can't get, you can't give, you know, uh, uh, the banks don't give you loans. The freeways cut you off. And so we're not going to get to the, how we find out how these freeways were set up since the 1950s to keep black people in certain ways. When they bring in uh, uh, concrete bed plants uh, 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 and uh, uh, leather tanning plants in these brown and black communities, and they keep you there and they poison the food and the water. That's residential segregation. To keep you within an invisible line. And not only do they keep you within that visible line through poverty and lack of education, they keep you there through the lack of proper food, and, and, and they, but they have a very strong police and military presence. And we even talk about that when we're talking about food sovereignty and, and wanting to plant community gardens because you got to go and get permits. You got to make sure that you're zoned right. You got to make sure that you have adequate water. 
You know, you got to get permission from these people to even grow your own food. So even with that, that's residential segregation. They're putting you in a, they're putting, they're segregating you away from, from prosperity and making sure that you have a whole bunch of poverty. And they make sure they set up these invisible lines. And they do it for so many years that the people actually think that it's normal. Mm -hmm. But when we start doing community gardens, when we start doing mutual aid, when we start breaking the cycles of poverty, when we start learning the basic, when we start learning the skills that we have the power to feed ourselves and determine what we want to do, that is sovereignty over our lives. It's just not food sovereignty. That's sovereignty over how we want to live. And so it's like Bobby Womack say, when the man across the railroad track, you know, uh, uh, finally understand that he has the power to cross that railroad track, that's when the problem starts. That's when the problem starts. When you stop, when you start going outside those lines of, of, of saying that I cannot move, I cannot grow for myself. You cannot, you cannot, you cannot negotiate with a hungry stomach. Mm -hmm. When a mother has a baby that is hungry and needs food and milk, you cannot negotiate with her and tell her, oh, it's going to be fine. She's going to get up and do some action. When you have people in your community that see uh, your neighbors being hungry and we know that we can do something about it, we do something about it because it is our duty to win. It is our duty to fight. We must love each other. We must hold each other. And so that's what food sovereignty means. That's what community gardens mean. That means that I look after my brother. I come after my sister. I'm going to make sure she have milk and eggs and grits and whatever means necessary, we're going to feed our people. And that means getting our hands in the dirt and growing these food, mean coming together and making sure that we're together. And so by coming together, we make a coalition of a powerful people. We make a declaration that we're going, that we're here. You know, you know, we, you know, we, 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 you know, we, we, we put the picket, you know, we put the protest signs down and we pick up the shovel. Mm. You know, there's a time for protest and there's a time for plowing. Mm. You protest when, you know, when your, you know, when your demands are not met. But if they meet your demands and you can go on, you pick up your protest signs when your demands are not met. You know, you know, you know, so so that's what we have to understand is that they might stick us in a community and they think that we're going to die, you know, they think that we're going to, you know, we're going to die, but, you know, they don't realize that, you know, we the seeds, we the seeds of our grandfathers and our grandmothers. They knew how to get out there and take them watermelons and take them yam seeds and grow something. You know what I'm saying? We've always been here. So, you know, the protest signs might be down, but the people have start picking up the shovels and the picks. That's real power right there when you have power over what goes in your belly and you're feeding your people. Yes. Yes. I think that's what, like, that's a quote I'm going to write down for sure. Sometimes you protest and sometimes you plow. That's I right. That. I, I want one last quote of yours that um, I want to highlight is just when you were talking about changing your zip code and how right. changing your zip code increased your life expectancy. Oh yeah. And yeah. Um I um I suffer from a um a liver disorder and um it makes me real sick sometimes. And so my diet had to change. And so while I was living at, um I wasn't able to get the proper food that I needed. I wasn't able to get the proper uh medicine that I needed to maintain my liver properly. Um, and also where I lived at, there was a lot of murders, um, a lot of police activity. I mean, you know, we were uh, living in an occupied space, Mili you know, police, uh, crime, lack of, you know, lack of, of proper food. And so when I moved to a different zip code, I was able to get the vegetables that I needed. I was able to get medicine. Um, holistic medicine to make my liver proper uh, function properly. Um, while I live right now, there's not a whole lot of police presence. 
Um, there's really no crime. I live in a very white community. And um, my weight has dropped. I'm not as heavy as I was. Uh, excuse me. Um, my blood pressure is better. I don't have to see my doctor like three times a week. I only have to go like once, uh, once a month now. It's because of the herbs and the vitamins, like milk thistle that I was able to acquire here, like burdock root, um, turmeric, a lot of different things that did not, that were not in my grocery store where I lived at. Um, I go to the store out here now, I can find those items. I can find turmeric, I can find ginger, uh, I can find a, a, a sour sop that really helps with my liver. Uh, um, so, but when I was living in the other area that I live with, I would have to travel at least 20 miles outside of where I was living at to get here, to get to this particular grocery store over here. I wouldn't shop where I lived at, which was right down the street, which I could have just, you know, caught the bus. But what I would do is that I would catch a bus, catch a train, then catch a bus and go to that grocery store and do it all over again. Because the food in my community was inadequate. I mean, it's like it's like living really at the UN. But over there, I was blocked in. So by coming out here, I'm able to diversify my food. Uh, if I want goat milk, I know where to go and get it. If I want um, kiwis, if I want uh, 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 mangoes, I know how to get it. And, but, and the first time I walked into the store out here and I saw that display of food, I damn near cried. Because I'm like, wow, the food don't look like it had a stroke. But you go into where I used to live at, I told you I walked up out of there because they had like green chicken. And I talked to the meat man. They trade training on how to handle meat. They learn where their meat come from. The produce department, they have to take classes on where their produce come from and how to take care of it. The other grocery store I was at in the African-American community, and I'm not saying, you know, hey, it is what it is, but it goes back to their residential uh, uh, segregation. They just throwing the bananas and the apples up there. So I'm asking about the kiwi fruit and, the, and, the, and all of this, and they're able to tell me. And I had one guy, one Hispanic guy, uh, he walked me all the way through everything. He told me where food, you know, where fruit in Mexico come from because he was willing to talk to me about that. You know, and I found out, like I said, this store by me, they have to take classes on produce and how to handle the meat. They have to take produce. They have to take classes on how to handle the milk, uh, cheese, everything. Over there, where was over there? It wasn't none of that. It wasn't none of that. So it basically really saved my life. It really did. By moving to another zip code. Probably mm -hmm. put, probably put like 20 years on me, 20 more years, as far as my health and my dietary. Because if I would have stayed down 52 now, if I had not gotten control of my diet, if I had been eating, and plus, um, you know, oh, you know, uh, 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 environmental pollution, um, ozone days really bad even near the freeway, I probably would, I probably would be very, very sick, probably about, about the age of 65. Mm. Thank you so much for sharing about what you're, what you're going through and what your experience is, is Alinka. I'm going to hand it to Ariel to ask some of the other questions that, um, that we really want to hear from you about. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank I just want to, hold a quick second just to really have everything hit me that you're saying. I, I remember the first time that you talked to us about the zip code thing and I, and then I started looking it up and just that reality is so um, disheartening to me and just such a wake up call of the things that I didn't even know were happening, you know, all around me outside of my own zip code. Um, yeah. And one of the other things that I want to say this is when it, just not even talking about food sovereignty. I have two sons. Mm -hmm. And my sons don't live in my old zip code. One of my sons lives right across the street from me. And my other son, he lives way in, um, in, the, in the suburbs. But if 
they had stayed in the old zip code, my sons probably would have gotten shot. Because one of my sons, when he was living in that zip code, uh, let me tell you something, Highland Hill 75241, For every 10 black men that's in the Texas Department of Correction, six of them come out of Highland Hills, 75241. Every black man that I've ever loved, from my father to my sons to the gentleman I'm with now have been incarcerated some type of form or fashion. If my sons had stayed in that area code, my baby boy, he was arrested and harassed in that area, in that zip code. He's lost several friends that have been killed there. Matter of fact, uh, three teenagers, um, no, a girl last night was 19, was shot right up the street from where I used to live at. Three teenagers were killed 4th of July in that zip code. Um, my son lives here now. Uh, he was, he's bipolar and he was a rat. He was picked up by the police. But me being his mother, I was able to intervene and we were able to bond him out. But those zip codes that I just talked about, 75241, 75, uh, yeah, 75214, 75215, 75210, 75216, those are what we call death zones. Because if they don't kill our sons, they lock our sons away. If they don't lock our sons away, our sons don't really have the potential to be what they need to be in those residential segregated uh, communities. So it's sad that I had to leave the community that I grew up in and cross that railroad track that I was talking about. We had to do it to live. And I really feel sorry for those uh, people who don't get that opportunity to leave, who have to stay there, uh, who have to go to those grocery stores, who whose sons have died or their sons have been incarcerated in those zip codes. And when you really get to studying and you really understand how this system has really taken a toll on us. It breaks your heart because you see for generations how we have been segregated to poverty and pain. But how do we fight that? We fight that by plowing a new land and growing a new hope and growing a new idea that we have power and we just have to sow the seeds and we just have to tend to that thought. And sometimes you cannot, sometimes you can't, you can't plow that dirt that you grew up under. You, you have to leave it because it's so bad. So I'm just thankful that my sons and that I'm not there, but I hate that I had to leave my home but once you start getting outside of it, you really see that it was our plan for our genocide. Oh, Alinka, we're here with you. We stand with you. I wish I could give you a hug and hold your hand and and just like I'm I'm so, like we're so here with you. Thank you so much. We're like I don't know. Yes, thank you, thank you. Somebody was talking about biochar. It wasn't talking about biochar, Miss. We were talking about just the seeds of planting that brand new soil, that brand new thought process that we can make it. You know, I know we can take charcoal and put it up in there, but having to find a new land means also having to find a new way of living, that we don't have to stay in that thought process. We don't have to stay in poverty. We can move beyond that. So that's what I was just saying about a new soil. You know, that's what I was talking about, a new soil. Okay. Next question. <laughs> she said, oh, she said, oh, is it LaCher? Am I saying your name right, LaCher? 
She said, oh. yeah, yes, okay. you are. Perfect. She said, oh, I thought you were talking about actual soil. Like, <laughs> yes. Soil. That's why you, 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 you take the barbecue coals and throw them over in the grass and <laughs> they fertilize the grass. Yeah, bar, we, yeah bar, biochar is a new thing. You know, biochar is a new thing. This is all leading into um, our next question. So, Arielle, I'm going to hand you the ball to ask our next question. Thank you so much. And I just want to just take a moment and just say thank you so much, Olinka. Your vulnerability is, is just incredible to share with us. And, and I just want to praise you for the work that you, you're doing and you continue to do. Um, and now that you're here to educate all of us through that, I mean, it's just truly a gift to be here in this space with you. So just thank you for everything that you're sharing. I want to talk about a quote that um, you shared with us when we had our one of our initial conversations. You said, I'm still fighting the powers that be, but I'm doing it one tree at a time. Right on. Um, and you mentioned shade, apar- sh- shade tree apartheid in that. And so my right. question to you is, how is fighting environmental issues directly linked to fighting against the oppression of black and brown people? I know that we, we went into that a little bit, but I'm just, I'm interested in your, in your views, specifically talking about the shade tree apartheid that you had mentioned to us previously. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the shade tree apartheid uh, is just like food apartheid. When they deliberately keep you away from a resource, just like apartheid in South Africa, where they deliberately kept the South African people away from freedom, you know, denied them their language, denied them, you know, try to deny them their language, uh, you know, try to deny them their culture. And that's in the, you know, in the city uh, uh, climate action plan here in Dallas. And it was a big article on that about them planting these trees in the Southern sector that were destroyed by the January storm, February storm. But you are not, you cut down our trees over in in the in the in the in the in the inner city where in the summertime it's 98 degrees and you give us a concrete bench to sit on and it's a hundred 110 degrees out in there and you cut down the trees because you don't want the 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 people lottering up under the trees and that goes back in again to what I was talking about police oppression. So they cut down the shade trees and the temperature from the concrete goes up even higher. And so when that happens, you have more crime going on. So the elders don't have any shade to sit up under. The, the, the lots are bare. Uh, there's no shade to really, you know, uh, uh, help the, the, the uh, oxygen for, for, the, for, the, uh, for, for the dirt. So that's what they're doing. They're cutting down our shade trees. They, you know, and the people are like sheep. You know, you're going from one pasture to the next trying to find... Uh, um, shade and this is really what's happening with the homeless people because they're going up on the bridges and now Greg Abbott has made it a law in the state of Texas for homeless people for you to be homeless is to be is, is, is to is to uh to be committing a crime mm-hmm. so you see a lot of the homeless people up under the bridges with their tents if you can get a tent because you can't camp out in the fields because there is no trees mm-hmm. and so they even went so far as to put rocks up under the bridges, but the homeless can't even sit, can't even, you know, can't even sit up under there uh, to get out of the, the, the sun. Right now, it's 98 degrees here in Texas, probably with a heat index of 100 and 304. So, where do the elderly people go? Where do the homeless people go? Where does the person who's trying to catch the bus because there's no bus stop for them? There's no trees in those communities. So, they cut down our trees. So even with that, we're segregated in shade, you know. And so um, with that with that being said, I really want to talk about the correlation between food justice and social justice. Dr. Martin Luther King um, talked about racial injustice in, in, in the uh, economics in 1960s. He said, racial injustice and economic injustice are inseparable twins. We cannot address one thing without addressing the other. 61 years later, 26 million Americans go hungry and the poverty rate spiking 16%. And through economic insecurity, economic insecurity doesn't discriminate. It does disproportionately impact black and indigenous people of color. 
B-I-O-P-C, communities. Growing income inequality is compounded by growing income inequality. Um, so when we see the racial and the wealth gap is leaving black folks, especially vulnerable, and poverty stems not from uh, a lack of cash. It, it stems from a lack of cash, not character. Adults spend nearly 40% of their uh, income on food. Uh, cities and laboratory cities are the laboratories for democracy. In 2021, we not only have to follow the unarmed killing of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmed Arbery, while those protests begin in response to state sanctioned violence against black bodies, they're also about the violence of poverty and lack of racial justice and food sovereignty and economic justice. Black people in this country deserve justice. We deserve free food. We deserve decent food. And we must realize that the very foundation of our foundation of our country was founded on this land and taken away from us through the death, through theft, genocide of the indigenous people. And then the rapidly industrialized, globalized capitalistic, uh, capitalism in this country is what's destroying the land and taking it from the people. Due to 400 years of slavery and genocide uh, and labor by human hands, we must understand when people are talking about uh, the, uh, the, the, the resources and the, 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 the resources uh, in this country, the, the, the resources that make this country rich, black people were the first resources. When we were put on those ships and brought to this country to put our hands in that dirt and grow tobacco and peanuts and cotton, we were the first product. We were the first produce in this country. Not tomatoes, not potatoes. We were the first produce. We were the first produce. We were the first crop grown in this country. We were the first crops transplanted from another place and put into this soil. And our blood, sweat, and our tears went into that soil. We grew America. So that is why food sovereignty is so important in the brown and black community. Because what we grew, we should own. There should not be a debate about how we gonna eat. The debate should about the debate should be about us getting this land back. Reparations does not just mean money. Yes. Reparations just does not mean saying I'm sorry. Reparations mean you giving this land back to those people that help build this country. And that goes to the indigenous people, the Mexican people, and the black people. And even the Irish, because they were slaves in this country. The only thing it was, after they did their indigenous servitude, they could, they could bounce out. Mm. So when we see people like George Floyd with that knee on his neck, that's just another example of a product being expendable. We've always been expendable in this country, but this country could not grow without us. Every place that, every part of America that's been a brown or black hand in it. So that's why food sovereignty is so important. Free the land, free the people. Yes. So it's, 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 it's twinned up. You cannot have one without, without each other. Hmm. <gasps> Oh my gosh, Alinka, you we are. Should have, we should not to have. We should not have to have permission to eat and to survive. Mm -hmm. You should never have to beg anybody for bread. I should never have to have permission to ask anyone about what's gonna go in my belly when this land is the land of abundance. If the land is there and the seeds is there, let's throw it and let's grow it. I love that. Let's throw it and let's grow it. Um, what a great motto that I will now use forever. Um, 
I see some questions starting to come into the chat. Olinka, thank you so much for all of the, the wisdom, the knowledge you just dropped on us. Um, we're going to slide over to a Q&A portion now. We've been collecting some questions for you. So um, if anyone wants to drop any more in the chat, we have some right now. Olinka, I'm just going to start off with one that we got pretty early on, which Hi. was asking about the... Um, the, the freeze in Texas in particular and the community gardens. So the question is, was the surge of the community gardens a response to the freeze and poor quality in the stores or something else? And, and oh. sort of going off of that, what can we learn that helped change everyone's behavior towards community gardens? Well, uh, first of all, thank you. Uh, the community gardens were uh, in response to the freeze. Uh, but even before that, when I was in the, uh, Texas, uh, when I was in the Poor People's Campaign, we went down to Waxahachie, Texas, and we did a, uh, 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 for Juneteenth, but also for the March in Washington, we set up a Poor People's Tent City, and we gave out over 800 and some odd pounds of food to the people, but we also set up community gardens, and that was, uh, that was last year. So a lot of people start, uh, this was uh, like 2019. So people really start getting into community gardens maybe like 2019. Um, you know, that was another surge, you know, saying, you know, we just don't want to be in the streets. We want to start growing our own food. So by 2019, people just really start um, coming together and uh, kind of like a, a trend came up that we wanted to do this. Now, 2020, uh, when COVID came in, we were going out and we were uh, giving food out, mutual aid uh, to a lot of the communities because, like I said, COVID had a lot of people, uh, you know, in house. So we were going out to the apartment complexes and doing that, uh, on top of doing the community gardens because we were like, some people may not be able to get to community gardens, but we can take box food, we can have hot lunches. We were set up in apartment complexes and doing that. So when the freeze came, um, we started the mutual aid just kind of like flipped over into that again. And so uh, since the spring has come now, people have started going back into the community garden. So we really would start doing it like 2019 and start doing that with the COVID on top of it. So it just it just went over from 2019 to 2000 uh, uh, where we at now. Thank you. Um, uh, another question that people have is, um, how do you go about advocating food sovereignty within local, state, and federal governments? Well, first of all, um, I would tell people to study, uh, you know, what food sovereignty is, and then go in and study. Um, I wrote it down. I want to make sure. Um, like I said, it was started in 1996. And it was started by the Lavia Campesina. They had a, a conference in Mali. And so they have a whole uh, constitution and a declaration of what they say food sovereignty is. And um, with delegates from five continents, uh, they clarified the economical, social, ecological, and political implications of the movement and created an international process to achieve recognition of the right food sovereignty and what it does because it's an international, it's an international federation now and become uh, involved in it. And we must understand that women and indigenous people have a historical or the historical creators and knowledges, knowledge about food, agriculture, and the traditional aquaculture. And another thing I want to say about this right here, is that there is a chicken shortage here in, in, in Texas. Chicken wings are going for like $28 a bag. Chicken wings. Now, people are doing community gardens, but ain't no black people here talking about chicken co-ops. You know, you know, having chickens, you know what I'm saying? You know, getting the eggs, uh, chicken farming, you know what I'm saying? So that's the other thing that I would really like for our people to really start getting into is getting chickens, you know, getting the eggs. Duck eggs, they go for like $12 an egg over here. 
goats, uh, goat milk. So everybody's growing vegetables, but I ain't seen nobody really get into the chicken industry, you know, organic eggs, you know? So that's another thing. So that's really food sovereignty is that when you control where your meat comes from. And remember I told you, the meat that was coming from the grocery store come from Colorado, California, New Mexico, but also having fish. Because remember I told you, the catfish uh, froze, cat, the, the farmers here are having a real hard time getting catfish, fish hatcheries. So that again means crossing the railroad track in our minds and going and doing other things besides just growing tomatoes and, and, and peppers. We need to start getting into the in industry of chickens and goats and also start understanding, taking classes on husbandry. And husbandry mean, don't mean trying to go find a husband. It means learning how to take care of animals. You know, how to, you know, how to main, you know, how to take care of animals. So I just want to say that, and, you know, join, you know, study what food sovereignty is and join that, that federation, you know, and, and, and get yourself together and, and go for it, you know, see what your state, see what your city has to say about it, but, you know, don't wait on nobody, you know, to feed you, you know, feed you, don't, don't do that. Thank you. Oh my gosh, we're gonna keep going with some questions. We have a couple good ones. Yes, yeah. so much. The next one I see is, um, is from Mike. So I see, Mike says, I see this process as a very slow incremental change. The land was taken from native people, free labor was forced from black and Irish people, Latino people gave the cheap labor. What kinds of educational components, if any, do you offer with the community gardens? Well, one of the things is that uh, learn what your soil is, get a college to come out and, you know, test your soil, see what your soil, you know, is capable of growing, um, see what crops, you know, are, are best growing on your soil. Um, I really advocate for uh, uh, taking college courses uh, online, like I'm doing right now. I'm, I'm taking a, 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 fruit, a food uh, uh uh, produce classes, also climate classes, how heat uh, and, and all that affects the, uh, the area. Uh, you know, talk to your local farmers, black, white, Hispanic. Um, you know, learn as much as you can about the land that you have. You know, also about, you know, um, permits. Learn really what you, you know, how your land is permitted. You know, uh, you know how, who can help you? Uh, you know, to get certain things done. Because like I said, uh, you know, it takes a lot, especially when you live in uh, black and brown communities. <laughs> you policed. You, you really police really hard. So you try to go set up a community garden somewhere, you know, they're they, they going to come after it. Well, do you have a zoning permit? Do, can you do this or can you do that? So that is why, you know, getting together and, and owning your land is important, but also understanding What's growing on your land? Is the dirt any good? Where is your water source coming? Uh, also, the air, because like we have a lot of concrete batch plants here. I would not dare try to have a community garden nowhere near not one of the concrete batch plants because that concrete turns the trees white. Here. So it's basically learning what your soil is can produce. You see how rich it is. Taking some courses on your land, I mean, on, on gardening, agriculture, talking to your city, and also talking to the farmers and the elders in your community and, and community uh, volunteers uh, about, you know, about helping. So I hope, I hope that helped out some way. Absolutely. Um, I am not entirely sure if we're gonna be able to get to all these questions, but we're gonna move along very quickly. So- oh, oh, also, like I said, I wanna say this, Definitely make sure that your soil is good because you find out a lot of these community gardens that we were trying to build, they have been contaminated by lead. Yeah. Um, so when we went to have it tested, we found out that it had been contaminated by lead and that's why they were trying to sell it to us or give it to us for so cheap. Uh, definitely learning about what's in your soil as well. Um, I have a question from Lisa, and Lisa says, can you talk a little bit more about food mirages? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. 
Okay, so a definition of a food mirage, and thank you so much for asking. A, uh, when we talk about a food mirage, when we talk about a, a food mirage is a phenomenon when there are places to buy food, but they are too expensive for their neighborhood. So we always say that when a Starbucks pulls up in your community, you might as well get ready for gentrification. Or if there's a burger, <laughs> a hamburger place that comes in your community and it's $15 for a hamburger or $6, $8 for a cup of coffee or a smoothie, the food is there, but you cannot afford it. So that is a food mirage. You see it, but it really ain't for you. Mm. And you know what a mirage is when you're in the desert, you're on a camel, you're thirsty, your tongue feel like leather, the camel ain't happy, and you see this big old pond of water and palm trees, and you go to it, and it ain't nothing but sand. It's there, but it's really not for you. It's not real. And something really valuable that we learned is these these words like food desert, food mirage, they make it sound like it's natural occurrence, like it's part of nature. Right. And even when we talk about a food swamp, that's another word, you know, we got to look up. The food swamp is areas where there's easy access to fast food and junk food. That's where you have all these mom and pop shops that you can go in and you can get a greasy burger uh, you can get soda pop. You can get some tater chips. You can get uh, you can get you can get some donuts. Like when I walked into the to the African Americans, just the black store. When I walked in, they had all this juicy juice and sweets and candies and donuts. Soon as I walked in, sugar smack, Tony the Tiger, everything. I mean, soda pop, Pepsi, everything that be a diabetic love fest. But when I walked into the white store, it was oranges, apples, watermelons, spaghetti squash, tangerines. And I asked him, I said, do y'all put you know, sweets like that on display in the front? He said, no. He said, when we come in, we want our customers to see nutrition. When I go into the other store, I don't see nutrition. I see no-nos. I see Twinkies and Ho-Hos and Oreos right there at the front as soon as you walk in. So that's what a food swamp is. When you can stick your arm out like this in every store on the corner ain't got nothing but Zuzus and Wham Whams. And that's another word for sugar sweets. You know, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's everything, you know, it's, it's nothing but junk for you. And so even with food apartheid, in certain states, the government or the government when you're on food stamps says that you can't have lobster. If you're on food stamps, you can't have lobster. You can't have steak. You can't have these luxury items because you can't buy soda pop. You can't buy. She froze again. Um, well, before she comes back, I also just want to take the opportunity to let y'all know that in our blog, we share all the resources that the community has shared with us. There's a lot of times when you get people from like Chicago or Michigan, they come down with their food stamps, they go crazy. They're like, you mean I can buy steak here? I can buy lobster? Because up there, they government, or they said, or they municipality, the government says that lobster and steak is a luxury. So again, he who feeds you owns you. So what you buy, you buy a whole bunch of junk. So and like so when I go like when I go into like Walmart, um, I watch what people put in their baskets. Like uh, just recently, President Biden gave people that had food stamps like seven thousand dollars worth of food stamps for the whole year. I was watching what people were putting in their baskets. I mean, like whoa! And the kids, you know, were out for the summer. Man, when I saw so much junk food. Tater chips, ice cream. It wasn't no healthy stuff going in these young people's baskets. But the elderly people, 
they were buying greens, collard greens, potatoes. So again, you know, food swamps, food mirages, food apartheid, and I don't want to say food deserts because a desert is a natural occurrence. This food desert thing is something that somebody made up. So, you know, let us look at that, the difference between that. A desert is a natural thing. What they do to us is not natural. It might be natural for their behavior, but it's not natural. It's abnormal. All right. So this is where this part of the meetup, we're going to shift. First of all, we're going to applaud you, whether silently on or, you know, like I will applaud you loudly here by myself. Um, and we're going to take a group photo together to just commemorate this moment and commemorate the sense of community. Because a lot of the things you talked about too, Olinka, like the work that we have to do on our own and the, 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 the work that it takes in our minds, in our hearts, in our communities, like in the land to make these changes. Sometimes we feel disenfranchised from each other. Sometimes we feel lonely. We feel scared. We feel like it's tiring. And I think like these moments when we are together and when we feel that connection and we feel that group power is really important to hold on to. So we're going to take this group photo right now. Everybody like, turn on your camera. It does not matter what you look like. It doesn't matter if your hair is done. No matter if your hair is covered. It don't matter if you're wearing makeup. Like we just want to see your face so we can take a group photo. And then we're going to move into breakout rooms and we have some <laughs> other announcements as well. So that's exactly the next thing that's happening right now. It, oh my God, all these beautiful faces. I can't Man, see them. So I, come here. I can't see them. What do I, what do I press? Go into gallery view. Like even all of you right now, if you go on the right upper hand corner of Zoom come or come on your phone. Come here. I'm trying to see all the people that's on here. A link sure. if you're on the, you should swipe. Just try to swipe over. Sometimes if you swipe it, um, oh, let's see. You can see everybody. Oh, oh my good. gosh, Mike, Jessica, Erica, Roy, Kia, I see you. Okay, so we're going to smile and TMS tech support will take a picture of all of us Thank together. You. Do we need to go to the mall? Yeah. She Three, said go to the mall. Two, oh. one, smile. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I hope like I come out okay. Yes, you did. We are gonna you and everyone will be able to see the picture. Um, okay, okay Ariel, I'm handing it off to you. I just had to like take that ball for a second, but I'm gonna let you keep going. Thank you for taking the ball. So thank you so much, everyone, for turning your camera on, for trusting us to take your photo. You're all beautiful in, in and out. So amen. Absolutely. If you would like us to tag you, we can. So just make sure that you are dropping your social okay. accounts. Mm -hmm. so that Oh, we, could, could be okay. then, um, we are going to um, go, okay, photo great. So now we're going to go into breakout rooms. This is just a reminder to everyone that the breakout rooms are not going to be recorded. So um, this is just a moment for you to me? be able to <laughs> together and sort of independently in small groups reflect on everything that's been said. So. Hold tight, we are putting you into breakout rooms now. A reminder again to drop your socials in the chat so we can tag you on our um, group photo. And then before everyone just quickly leaves, we're gonna put you in, as I said, breakout rooms, and then we're gonna come back and do a whiteboard. So we're gonna talk about everything. So there's a lot more to come. So hang tight with us as we are putting you all into breakout rooms. I see everyone dropping their socials in the chat. This is awesome. Thank you so much for this. We will keep in touch with everyone or try our best to. <laughs> um, yeah. I also just want to say thank you to, to those who've been really vocal in the chat too with the resources and the information that's being shared. I'm going to join, I'm going to join my breakout room now. <laughs> See you on the other side. Hi folks. We're coming, we're coming back from our, Awesome breakout rooms. I don't know about y'all, but I had a wonderful conversation with the folks that I was sharing space with. Um, 
And so, yeah, it's time for it's time for a whiteboard. Actually, one of my favorite moments of the meetup, because this is a moment of reflection and this is a moment of grounding where we can really come back to the wisdom that we've received here today, the quotes, the learning, the surprises, the heartbreak. And um, I'm just going to actually talk about the instructions, because when you see the screen, if you actually um, at the top of your screen, you go to view options and then you'll see annotate and you can select that and then you can select the text feature and you can actually literally text things and write things onto the board um, or you can write them in the chat and we'll do it for you. But 10 people can annotate at the same time. So this is actually like a community learning space where um, we can share and revamp like what's been said today that we want to remember. Also, um, it's important to me also that we take a time to like commit to what we're taking from this and what we're going to move, what we're going to do moving forward. So if there's a commitment that you want to share with all of us of like, of what, whatever it is that you feel like you want to commit to, you want to shift in your life moving forward. Um, please add that on the, on the whiteboard. Um, definitely someone needs to add Alinka, correct me if I'm saying it wrong, but those who feed you own you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Uh, those who feed you own you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Mm hmm. There were a couple quotes. There were a, a couple things. That <laughs> yeah, this one says plowing a new land and growing a new hope. Yes. Connecting to the elders and learning from them. Yes, exactly. Someone asked, what can we do? And Alinka gave a lot of information. Oh, Alinka, a question earlier that was asked that we didn't get to. Can you reiterate the books that you've been reading from today and just share yeah. with us? Um. One of them is Pan African. Oh, I think she freezed. She, she froze. She'll come back. Let's share. Thank you so much for being here. I, I love that you love this group. I'm so glad that you're here and that you signed up too. Um, uh huh. You're back. You were you froze for a second there, Olinka. So I was okay. talking over you, but I'm gonna sh shut up now. Okay. Okay, Pan-African Social Ecology. Um, and it's by Modibo, M-O-D-I-B-O, K-A-D-A-L-I-E. Kadeli. And the other one is uh, Power to the People. The World of the Black Panthers by Stephen Shames and Bobby Seale. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Food dumpster. Awesome book. Someone said an awesome book to read is Mark Bittman's Animal Vegetable Junk. It complements a lot of what we're discussing tonight. So right. we'll add that in the resources on the blog, um, Animal Vegetable Junk. Right. And this other one I'm reading is called um, World of Wonders. Uh, <laughs> Uh, in praise of fireflies, whole sharks, and other astonishments. And it's by Amy, and her last name is really crazy to read. In, Amy is spelled A I M E E N E Z. And I was supposed to tell you to bring them food containers and stuff that you have because we got a catering on Saturday. Yeah. A I M E. A I. Yeah. Uh, you got to go back. A I. A M E. M A I M E. And N E Z. 
H U K U M A T A T H I L. Yes. Yeah. She got a long name. <laughs> oh, what? It needs to be spelled exactly how it is. That, that it is. That's what her name is. Yeah. It is. Yeah. So, but that's uh, that's what basically I'm really reading right now. Thank you for sharing all of that. I, I'm and going I really hope the people would donate to Daughters of the Diaspora. I really hope the people donate to them. Yeah. Yeah. And this is a perfect time to just say that any donations that come to the mix space um, with the link that uh, we'll put in the chat right now, it's a PayPal link for the mix space. We double the donations that come through and then we'll give them to the organization. So your money will be doubled um, if you donate to the mix space during this month. Um, and we do publish our meetup on YouTube. Um, we are having a meetup 2.0 on Instagram on July 20th, and it is just an opportunity for us to continue the conversation. There's so many different perspectives that we can come to this. And so it's another opportunity to expand the conversation. So make sure you follow us on Instagram and, um, to continue staying up to date with the folks that we're featuring and um, the people that we're hearing from. And um, Arielle, do you wanna talk about our next meetup? Sure. Our next meetup, we are talking about um, representation in media and sort of the evolution of diversity in media, what that looks like, what, what type of um, gatekeepers are existing in media and we are getting a lot of just different insight than I think what is typically expressed in the media, if that makes sense. So we're just talking about diversity. We're talking about aesthetics. We're talking about lighting. We're talking about lighting specifically when it comes to black and brown individuals on camera. We're talking about directors and actors and directors behind the camera, actors in front of the camera, all that good stuff. So we are diving deeply into just representation in media and what that looks like and diversity throughout, throughout media. Um, yeah, also I just wanted to call out um, the fact that if there is anything you wanna connect to, with us about, we are going to drop our email into the chat. It's um, connect or contact at the mixspace.com. We're dropping that into the chat. I know that there were some people that were saying that they would love to connect with us. We would love to connect with you. So please give us um, just shoot us an email and we will, we will get right on that. Um, we are also going to link a feedback form for this meetup, um, in the chat. And it will also be in our Instagram bio. So we would love to hear your feedback on this event, what you took away from it, anything that could be approved. If you think so, we are open to all feedback and we just love hearing from the people who have joined us on these community calls. So, yeah. Yes, Angela, the Linktree Black Feminist Project for the Bronx, New York-based food access and other resources. Yes. Yes. Yes, Caitlin, we'd love to connect with you, like to connect with our breakout rooms folks. Um, thank you for drawing this beautiful tree and Oh, this is such a beautiful whiteboard. I love our whiteboard. Oh, nice. <laughs> nice. One of the prettiest yeah, so whiteboards is, we've ever had. Yeah. <laughs> Power to the people. It looks like a tree with an afro. That's nice. 